Well, not necessarily. It depends on, I mean, it was designed again to be revenue neutral. And HP 441 never really got to a point it was introduced. And you've had a version of it. Tim knows uh, of the details of what it contained. It didn't contain more than anybody else. But we didn't really worry about saying HP 441 stands for this as a final proposition because it never got beyond a, a committee hearing. Got a committee hearing, passed out the committee, and that was never heard before in the House. Didn't get a Senate hearing, committee hearing, didn't get a full Senate hearing. So HB 441 was the first word in talking about the possibility of sales tax on expanded basic services. It was far from the last word. Just because, I mean, there were some people that were saying, make it revenue neutral, and to do that, you have to decrease significantly the sales tax rate. There were other people that were saying, great, that's fine. Let's at the same time talk about decreasing the income tax rate, giving people a break on income tax. That, those were discussions. Tim would know better than I do whether that was ever part of what came out of the committee, but I sort of shrugged my shoulders about that because we never got to a point where we were discussing any of that detail on the House floor. So the point being, um, if you want to raise rates, you can, and you will really raise more revenue, whether it's for public education, raising income tax rate, or there was the sales tax rate, or maybe lower the rates somewhat, but expand the base, while at the same time saying our goal here is to raise, let's say, another billion dollars in sales tax revenue for the general fund. You can do that. There's just an unlimited array, ad array of choices that we have in the legislature about how to structure tax reform. And in doing so, whether you want to raise in revenue, increase revenue, decrease revenue, raise tax rates, decrease tax rates, get people tax cut, whatever. But those are all the kind of things that we're on the table that we're talking about, the possibility of. Um, you could, we have an income tax rate with a flat rate right now, 4.95, single rate for both uh, personal and corporate. That could be changed. You could increase that, you could lower it, you could put progressivity into it. I've been an advocate, a, a loud, proud advocate of progressive taxation. I've said my personal feeling is those who really are doing well in the state of Utah should step up to the plate and pay more out of their abundance for our public schools. Some people agree. Most of the legislators do not agree. That bill didn't get very far. <laughs> try. I'm going to keep trying on it in the future. And I'll support other people who try. Debacus was another one. I should associate myself with Jim Debacus. <laughs> Jim took my bill a year or two after I ran it. Back, so we both had the same result. Uh, we talked about the sales tax rates at 4.85. If you want to increase rates, of course, it's going to impact everything and everybody that currently pays on, uh, sales or income tax or fuel tax, whatever it is that you're increasing. But that is an option, raise rates. Next um, option is statewide property tax. Uh, I mentioned uh, property tax right now is allocated or imposed on a, a county uh, or a school district rate uh, basis. We don't have a statewide school or a statewide property tax. You could put one in place to raise additional revenue. You could use it for the general fund. You could use it for the uh, education fund. You could do with it whatever you want. And it would be something that could raise some significant money if you with that second bullet point. If you put in point one, which is a very small percentage of statewide property tax, it would increase everybody who owns real property, it would increase their taxes. And 0.1% would increase, uh, would raise up to 300 million annually and make a significant difference to the education fund. Um, keep in mind how big the education fund is, though. I mean, Thomas, do you know how much money that, that from the state income tax do we use specifically for education? You said it was about 4.5 billion, but how much of that is higher ed? Around 600 million for higher ed. So if you add corporate to the So what I hear Dr. Young saying is, if you did this, it would add less than 10% increase to the public education coffers. If you took, did that and took every nickel of that 300 million and put it in public ed, it would be a significant amount of money, but it wouldn't get us anywhere near where a lot of people say we need to be in terms of per pupil spending. I mean, I'm trying to put these things in perspective. Okay, payment in lieu of taxes, this third bullet point is something that actually 
I've worked on a fair amount with my friend, uh, Representative Ivory. This is a good example of working across the aisle. Representative Ivory, agree, uh, I agree on this. Payment in lieu of taxes is money that is paid by the federal government on the property that they own in the state of Utah. About two thirds of the state of Utah is owned by the federal government. We can't tax any of them, like none of them. It's all off the table. And that's been a real hardship for Utah and a lot of other states that have a high percentage of their lands that are owned by the feds. So a long time ago, the states went to the federal government and said, hey, you've got to give us some payment in lieu of those taxes that we're losing out on. And the feds said, okay. And they come up with this, what we call PILT, the Payment in Lieu of Taxes Program. And I don't know exactly how they come up with the numbers, but Payment in Lieu of Taxes, the last meeting that we had down hall was with Jonathan Ball and Holiday, and he was there. He was attending and he said, my recollection is that we get about $40 million a year in money in payment of low taxes from the federal government on their property that they own. Well, let me tell you something. That's not the county. Goes that's to the counties. What? Goes to the county. Goes straight to the counties. That's right. It's not going to the state. That's a good point. Thank you, Glenn. It goes to the counties. But, but the point is, it's money that is used for various expenditures to benefit the people of the state of Utah, whether it goes to the state or whether it goes to the county. I don't have a problem with the county. What I want to see is greater income. I think most Utahns would agree, and Ivory, I know, is on the same page with me. Um, and I think most legislators, I can, I, in fact, I'd be surprised if any legislators disagreed with us on this in terms of trying to get more money out of the feds. What we, the most recent thing that I think is really kind of exciting that uh, Ivory and I have been working on and other people on the Federalism Commission is, this is a, commi a commission that is made up of uh, state legislators from both the House and the Senate, and we meet regularly, and we uh, have put out a request for a proposal for, uh, uh, for a company that will do a better job of more specifically and uh, objectively valuing public lands held by the feds and presenting that information to the federal government to say, if this is payment in lieu of taxes, you should be looking at the actual value that those federal lands have and increasing significantly the amount of money that you pay us. Four times. For what? I've seen an analysis that you've evaluated our national forest as open space in, in the counties, we would get four times the yeah. amount of money we get. We're talking about a significant amount of money here. But you said, you said right now it's $40 million. $40 million now. But well, four times that is $160 million. Well, hey, that's a lot of money. I mean, in terms of the entire size of the state budget, it's not that much money, right? right? But we're talking about aggregation of a lot of different <coughs> sources of revenue. So a lot of money on county budgets. A lot of money on county budgets. So yeah, anyway, the we, rural <coughs> counties, national parks, but a 90%, 95% public lands, those guys are strong. Oh, yeah. He picked places like Wayne County. My father was born in Teesdale. I have a soft spot in my heart for Wayne County. But it's, it's like 90 plus percent more by the feds. So uh, in the last few months, probably six or eight months, we on the Federalism Commission authorized a company called Geomancer to provide us with a pilot program of valuing federal lands down in Washington County. It was great. They came back, they reported what they came up with. Really interesting stuff objectively verifiable stuff. We were excited about it. We authorized it. We, well, we haven't gotten this. But we're in the middle of doing an RFP for uh, anybody, you know, Geomancer and other people that were out, anybody who wants to bid on it for the entire state. But once we get this information, and if we could get other states to do this too, if it's just Utah going to the Congress and asking for this money, not nearly as likely that you get the money generated from Congress. But if the Western states, you know how much of California is owned by the federal government? You don't think about California as being a federally owned land, a uh, federal owned land state. It is. It's like 40, 45% of the entire state of California is owned by the federal government. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and uh, don't quote me those numbers, but it's really significant. Uh, Nevada is the highest. It's at over 80%. But Utah's number two. Two thirds. Two thirds of our land. And, you know, Idaho and Wyoming and Colorado, uh, yeah, Colorado and New Mexico, Arizona, they're all like 30, 40, 50% of their land is owned by the federal government. So if we could, not just Utah alone, but if we could get other states to buy into this idea of presenting as a unified front information to Congress to say you're grossly under 
around with these federal lands for purposes of tow payments. You need to get more money to us. That would help. You can say, yeah, but the federal government is subject to political will. I get that. It'd still be better than nothing. Okay. Um, that's the problem. Now, if you do that with property taxes, uh, you're going to impact property on the real estate and cars. That's both good and bad. Some people say there are folks who got the money that can pay. Other people say, no, no, no. Disproportionate number of property owners or retired folks on fixed incomes hit them hardest if, if you increase taxes in this area. Next, gross receipts tax. This is, I can explain this relatively quickly by saying it's just a tax on the total revenue of the business. I'm a lawyer in my own law firm. Let's say my gross revenue in a year is a million dollars. And let's say 900,000 of that is paid out in salaries and uh, overhead, you know, rent and legal research and furniture and stuff like that. I'd walk home at the end of the year with $100,000 in, in revenue from my company. The gross revenue, the gross receipts tax doesn't care about my net revenue. It just says, we're going to uh, impose a relatively small percentage tax on the gross receipts of your company. That's the nature of the gross receipts tax. We don't have one in Utah. There aren't a lot of states that do. Do you know, Dr. Young, how many states do? Five? No, one, five out of the portion. One has a total gross receipts tax. Okay. We went down that path in the last three months. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's an idea. And, and a lot of people <clears throat> like it. I'll tell you the, one, the thing I like about it. I don't like it from this perspective that it would hit me as a small business owner hard, but here's one thing I like about it. It's relatively easy to calculate, relatively easy to impose, and it's relatively small in terms of the percentage. If you're talking about businesses with skinny margins, it's also relatively burdensome. Impact it would be businesses and consumers because they're just going to pass those costs on to their consumers. I mean, from my perspective, is legal services all, almost all I is done on a contingent fee basis, a percentage of anything I collect. I'd look at that and say, okay, I've got to increase the percentage of my, uh, the contingent fee percentage to cover that. Next, carbon tax. This is an interesting thing that our colleague, Representative Briscoe, in our the House Democratic Caucus has proposed. Other people have proposed various things along these lines, but he, his HB 304 in the last legislative session was really innovative and creative in the sense that it was a big, broad carbon tax that would have generated a ton of income and tax revenue by imposing a tax on fossil fuels. It was designed to be net neutral. It wasn't designed to raise revenue. It was designed basically to encourage more renewable resources to be used as opposed to non-renewable resources, fossil fuel uh, uh, consumption. And it would also, it was also to be used for uh, funding in part the dislocating economic effects that moving from uh, non-renewables to renewables would have, particularly in rural parts of the state. So if I pay places down in my car, I'm through Shane County and out in Uenta County, who are going to be particularly hard hit, Emory County, by this move from uh, non-renewables to renewables. And this bill, HB 304, was designed to be thinking about moving in the direction of trying to both encourage that movement, because we do want to move to non-renewables. I don't know a lot of people that don't feel that way. But we want to do it in a way that eases the dislocating economic effects for people who are currently really dependent on their economic behavior on uh, non-renewable. Yeah? Uh, when we think about fossil fuel taxes, we think about consumption. But uh, there's such a thing as uh, oil and gas and mineral extraction yeah, taxes. taxes. Yeah. Oh, severance taxes. Uh, my impression, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that Utah has probably the lowest uh, severance tax rate in the nation, and this has a lot of loopholes which allow many producers to really essentially pay no tax. Uh, is, I is that the case? At this. I, I ran a bill a few years ago to increase the rates of severance tax on oil and natural gas. We don't even have severance tax on coal. Like nothing. There's no severance tax on coal at all. Um, which is a lot different than our neighboring states. Wyoming, Colorado, other states. Wyoming has funded a huge degree to of their uh, government services off the service tax on coal in that state. And the same is true, of course, for oil and natural gas in Wyoming. Our severance tax rates are lower than our neighboring states by a significant margin. Um, we also have severance taxes on other minerals, some minerals, but the big producers of revenue from severance taxes of oil and natural gas. Why does nobody ever talk about that in Utah? It's tough to do politically. I, I tried. I had an expert come in from um, the U of U and testify in front of the committee and 
Uh, it was a revenue taxation committee. It was before you got there, Tim. And we just didn't get anywhere with it because the oil and natural gas industries, the non renewable lobbyists, come in and just hammer us on that and say, you know, we, we're struggling as it is. And look, in a way, they have, they're, that's an extraordinarily qualified me to tell you guys. You're closer to you went to Duchesne County than I am. You feel the effects of the boom and bust cycle in that area more than I do, living in Salt Lake County. But we all know it's not a real, it's a tough way to. So, if your financial folks um, estimated the potential income from some level of severance tax, do we have any idea? Yeah, we had we had a fiscal note on that. Yeah, and that when my my bill would have run. Right now, I think Dr. Thomas, I may be wrong on these figures because it's been a while since I ran that bill and thought about it. My recollection is that the severance tax on oil and natural gas is around three between three and four percent. Our neighboring states are like eight, nine, ten percent, things like that. Um, and my record, I can't remember the details, but what my bill would have done, I think it would have raised it to like five or six percent. Dealt with that, you mentioned a loophole for stripper wells. Yeah, I mean, that's a significant loophole because we don't tax those at all. There's no severance tax on stripper wells. That's my recollection. But my recollection is that it would have raised about $75 million a year. Again, enough to, to you know, Make a world of difference? No. Significant? Absolutely. Add it to other ways in which we can raise revenue or shift things around. Uh, if it was accumulated to help some of those people in those counties yeah. that are going to be without jobs, yeah. it would be a big deal. Yeah, and I agree with that. Anyway, if you want to do a carbon tax, the folks that are going to be most impacted is the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel consumers. Next, uh, you can remove your works. We've got a lot of uh, earmarks in the general fund right now. The biggest earmark of all, of course, in our state budget is what we've talked about before. The earmark on the income tax for public and higher education. And there are a lot of people who don't like it at the legislature. And there are a lot of people talking about getting rid of it. Very controversial if you did that, because as you all know, uh, we're already 50% of the country in terms of what people spending. And there are some people that say, we, we should be moving in the opposite direction. We should be, as Glenn referred to and others, we should increase our income tax rates so that we increase the amount of money available in an earmarked fund for general public education. But for purposes of addressing the structural imbalance and the rigidity, the fact that we've got our hands tied a little bit at the legislature, removing earmarks, whether it's on the general fund for education or in some of the earmarks that are in the sales tax, and uh, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Removing the earmark for the education fund from income tax is is one way you could increase flexibility within our state budget. But another way is to, in, is to remove some earmarks that are currently in the general fund based on sales tax revenue. About 22% of the general fund is currently statutorily earmarked. Most of those are for transportation uses. You've got the fuel tax, which is earmarked for transportation. That's separate from the general fund. But you've got, a few years ago, and I thought this was a bad idea at the time, I voted against it, but it passed. We earmarked a percentage of future growth. This was back in like 2012, 2013, Thomas, do you remember? It was 2011. Was it 2011? I always, you know, time flies. But anyway, we said 40% my recollection of future growth in sales tax fund is gonna to have to be earmarked for transportation needs. It was a dumb idea that handcuffed is even more than we already are handcuffed, but that still remains. Um, you can find alternative funding sources for transportation with three other potential general fund revenue sources. If you do that, the impact of this is going to be transportation funding. Next, you can eliminate the education fund earmark. We've talked about that a little bit. That would be, uh, you can get, if you really want to go through it and change the earmark for public and higher education that's in, this, in the uh, current budget, you would have to change the state constitution. Changing the state constitution means getting a two-thirds vote in each chamber of the House of the Senate, having the governor sign off on it, and then having the people of the state of Utah sign off on it. There are other ways, however, of mitigating the effect of the earmark in the education fund that, from my perspective, are more nuanced and maybe insidious isn't the right word, but I don't put anything past some of my colleagues in the legislature in terms of increasing flexibility while at the same time sort of circumventing public input on it, other than who you vote for to serve in the legislature. 
We had a bill that was a uh, resolution that was passed in the Senate in the last session, SJR 3, that would have diluted the degree to which we are strictly, uh, that we are restricting funds in the, in the education fund for public and higher education by saying we're also going to make those income tax uh, revenues available for some social service spending, which uh, the rationale at the time was this is going to help the kids that are in the great state here in the state of Utah, so it makes some sense. That uh, passed the Senate, but it did not get out of, uh, didn't come to the House, we didn't debate it in the House. Look for something along these lines to be debated again in the next session or two. Controversial? Yes. This is a great example of our budget decisions revealing what our values are. And we'll see what direction we move in this. My own feeling is, if you want to, the only way that I think you're going to get education, public education, people to sign off for moving the earmark for the uh, income tax fund, the, the education fund, is if you provide some equal or greater level of sure, assurance that we're going to have at least the funding for public education that we've had in the past. And I don't know how you come up with that, quite honestly, because there isn't a very, there isn't a better assurance that you're going to have a steady stream of income for public education than saying what we got. All income tax goes straight to uh, the education fund and has to be used for public and higher education. Now, again, we can circumvent the, the restrictions that are found in the state constitution by saying, yeah, that's true. We, the legislature, can adjust the rate at which we tax people on their incomes. So, you know, if you go down to 4.5, you're going to lose a lot of money out of the education fund. If you go up to 5.5, you're going to get a big increase in funding for the education fund. And none of that has to be uh, addressed in, in the form of a constitutional change to our state constitution. Okay, if you do that, uh, if you remove the earmark or tinker with the earmark, it's going to impact the guaranteed source of education funding. Tourism tax, this is something that hits people up here in Los Angeles on county hard, or could uh, impact you. And that is that leisure and hospitality is one of the fastest growing sectors of our economy. We have stuff that brings people to the state of Utah and other states to die for. I don't have to tell you this know that. Uh, there is a lot of temptation on the part of some legislators to say let's increase tourism taxes because it's disproportionately paid by out-of-staters. Disproportionately that burden is borne by non-Utahns. Now it's also borne by Utahns, disproport not disproportionately, but to a significant extent too. When we all like to go down to Moab and Arches and Grand, or, uh, Grand Staircase or Bryce Canyon, if you want to uh, increase the tourism tax or give the local agencies, the counties and the towns, the cities, the ability to raise their transit room tax rates. We could all be paying more to stay at Ruby's Inn, for example, or the uh, hotel in, in Moab. So, you know, it could hit Utahns too. But it's disproportionately borne by people who don't live in Utah. And it's not a coincidence, I think, that a lot of the other big tourist attraction parts of our country, like Los Angeles, New York City, they have really high tourism tax rates relative to the state of Utah. But I'll tell you something else. When we start talking about this, one of the things that the Representative Quinns and I, and I also want to recognize the presence of a number of my other colleagues, Representative Carol Spackman Moss, who is our uh, uh, majority or minority whip in the House and the Democrats, Representative Polson, she and I came into the legislature at the same time in 2009. She's in the House Democratic Caucus. We've also got Senator Kathleen Reby. A relative newcomer. Nice to have you with us. But when we talk about these things up there, when we start talking about the possibility of increasing tourism taxes, you know who we hear from immediately? We hear from Enterprise Rental Car and other people like that who come to us, legislators say, don't be like that. Don't be thought talking about this. This impacts our business. So much like we saw with the idea of taxing services that were previously untaxed. People who are about to, they see the prospect of getting greater taxes on their services, have a tendency to go out and hire lobbyists and come talk to them. I don't know if you know. Anyway, tourism taxes are an interesting idea, and I think we're talking about sport. Uh, sports gambling and lottery, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it's sort of self-explanatory. It's, it's sports gambling, you can, you can impose an income, or not an income, but a sports gambling tax and never uh, uh, impact other people, people other than who are gambling online. I mean, if I go online and want to bet on the baseball games or the football games, we don't have a tax on that activity right now. We 
can put a tax on that activity if you want to. Raise a lot of money. <laughs> Same is true for, of course, lotteries. Now, now Nevada, I don't think that, uh, well, I wanted to say the, the income that Nevada generates just off sports betting, online sports betting, is, two, is 20 million. Significant amount of money. But having said that, it's not going to make or break the budget in terms of uh, credit or, or uh, lacking surpluses or, or deficits. Um, the amount of money that is generated in other states around Utah by lotteries is around 75 million. It varies a lot from state to state. We can do that. One of the downsides of doing that, there, well, there are two sides. Generally speaking, people who are against that fall into one or two categories. The, the people who are put off by it, I'm talking about legislators. The legislators who were put off by it because of the moral angle of gambling, and the legislators who were put off by it because, generally speaking, this is a very regressive tax. The people who end up paying it are the people who can also please afford it. And you can say, boy, that's awfully paternalistic of you folks out of the legislature. Yeah, it is. So we can talk But if you do that, gamblers are going to impact it. Next, transportation user fee. This is a tax that you can impose on various uh, types of economic activities. You can assess on residents, you can assess on businesses based on the traffic levels that are generated by each type of economic activity, whether it's a commercial activity, whether it's a big high density uh, residential activity. You could say uh, the developer of a huge uh, apartment building needs to pay a uh, use, not a use tax, but an impact fee, basically for their uh, activities in terms of the money that is, or the economic, or not the economic, but the drain that they impose on the local um, area in terms of sewer or water, and electricity and roads and things like that. These types of impact fees uh, are sort of a user pay kind of system. A lot of people like it because it does target uh, the income that comes in based on the kind of economic activity that's being conducted, going on there. If you do that, you're impacting the businesses and residents that use those types of economic services. Next slide. There are some additional questions, overview questions. Uh, we've talked about some of them. Do we want to have these, be, these tax proposals be revenue neutral? Do we want to raise income? Do we want to uh, reduce income for the state coffers? We can do any one of those things. It's a matter of policy and politics. People of the state of Utah need to speak to those issues. Who should bear the greatest burden? That second big bullet point. That's this question of do you want to make taxes uh, broad the base lower the rate is something that we hear a lot about. That is, has a tendency to be relatively regressive. Uh, on the other hand, you can put in place, whether it's income tax or sales tax or other types of taxes, methods of taxing that are more progressive in the sense that those who have greater resources are going to be designed a tax system where they pay more. Uh, how quickly should the new plans be implemented? Some people say you need to deal with this in the next year or two, legislature. Other folks say it's not that urgent a situation. Take your time, do it right. I have a tendency to want to be on the second end of that question. Here's some resources. This is the last slide. Here's some resources that you can go to to get information about these tax issues. The first website is the National Conference of State Legislatures, a great little um, organization, not a little at all. Uh, most of us are, have been to or are going to National Conference of State Legislators conferences. We have one coming up next month in Nashville. Many of us are going to. They've got a great reputation for being relatively nonpartisan and for providing us good information so that we can uh, come up with the best decision making as legislators about various things. But they have a, a budget and revenue and taxation uh, uh, section within the, their or 